Hi, everybody. I'm John Solly. I'm an editor with Shaw Media. I'm here with Dr. Irfan Hafez, an infectious disease specialist with Northwestern Medicine. Doctor, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're going to take a few minutes today and talk about masks for face coverings. Uh, businesses across the state have mandated them to require entry, and the Illinois State Board of Education set out guidance this week for a safe return to schools that includes face masks. Uh, we at Shaw Media sent out a survey uh, essentially to take the temperature of how parents and students feel about that guidance, and uh, we'll have results of that on our website on Sunday afternoon. But from those responses, uh, we saw a lot of anxiety and even some misinformation out there on masks. So I'm happy to talk with uh, someone who knows a lot more about this than I do uh, today. So my first question for you, Dr. Hobbits, is why is it important to wear a mask or a face covering when you can't socially distance yourself? Sure. So, so the, in the community, the main reason to wear the mask is in case you are pre-symptomatic or you're an asymptomatic carrier that you are reducing the amount of virus you're spreading. That could make the difference between whether you, you be, infect others or not. So a simple thing, just, you know, grandma would always say, cover your face when you're coughing. Similar to that, just a simple face mask will reduce the amount of exposure to other people. It's not to protect you, it's to protect others. Now, the initial guidance, you know, back when this all started was to not get a mask, save it for healthcare workers. We hear some people say, well, the guidance is always changing. But when it came to masks, it changed once in March. Why is it important that guidance may change throughout a pandemic? So especially when you're talking about a novel virus, it's a new virus, and we, there's a lot of uh, unknowns that we had at, when we first started out with this. And therefore, early on, we're taking parallels to some other diseases and making some assumptions and making guidance and recommendation based on that. Depending on the pattern of the spread, there may be things that may not have been at first thought of as useful that may now be useful. And that's why things may change. And it's really as simple as, not that it was wrong, but that you know, the, the most benefit initially was thought to be at the hospital level there. And that community may have, the, the, again, you're weighing the ben risks and the benefits. If the benefits are minimal, it may not be worth it. But as we've seen this spread in the community, the benefits may actually be worth it. And therefore the masks were recommended. Uh, let's sort of knock down some some misinformation that might be out there on, on masks and wearing a mask. Will wearing a mask reduce my oxygen levels and cause hypoxia? Yeah, to, pretty much the answer to that is no. I mean, there may be some specific medical conditions and things like that may, that, that may, may do that. But for the most vast majority of people will not. And if you just think about it, you know, surgeons will wear masks for 10, 12 hours at a time in the operating room. Staff does that. That's not new. That's been going on for you know, multiple decades, um, and we've not had that issue there. Certainly, there are some situations where you may not be able to breathe quickly, especially if, say, you're running, you're in a marathon. Probably not the best idea to be wearing a mask at that time, because it's not about the hypoxia. It's about how fast you can breathe through that mask. That, it's more that than actually developing hypoxia. You should not develop hypoxia. Uh, why is a cloth face covering enough to slow or stop the spread? Won't some of those masks maybe be too loose compared to, say, an N95 mask? So uh, a cloth mask is mainly recommended because, again, we're weighing the risks and the, ben the benefits there, that there's adequate benefits just from a simple cloth. All that you're trying to do is stop some of the droplets that are being exhaled to be caught. And a simple cloth mask is more than sufficient for that. A couple of and, things. Do you want, so go, go ahead. ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. So the N95 mask, again, the principle is very different. The N95 mask is not to prevent the spread of infection, but it's to prevent you from acquiring it. And it's mainly effective when what you're trying to avoid is airborne. And that's as opposed to droplet. So when we are doing medical procedures on patients, say with COVID or tuberculosis or there's a variety of other diseases. We know that there is more virus in the air during those procedures because of what we're doing. The N95 filters that air as it's going in. So the N95 is really for those particular situations. I personally, yes, I wear an N95 when I'm in those patients' rooms and we're dealing with that. But when I'm outside, I wear a cloth mask. 
why is it important for uh, that everyone who can, and obviously there are going to be medical exceptions to this, wears a mask instead of just people in higher risk categories? Yeah. So the, again, the issue for the mask isn't necessarily for you to not get disease, but not to spread to others. And therefore, if only the high risk people are wearing the mask, again, it's, it's not to prevent them. It's really to prevent those that they're being exposed to. And we know that people who are younger, who maybe otherwise feel that they're less at risk for complications, um, they're the ones more likely to spread because they're not gonna go to the doctor. They're not feeling too bad. They're still spreading. So we wanna stop it at the source, turn it off at the spigot, rather than trying to stop the drain. <laughs> what, uh, what advice do you have for parents or teachers who are gonna be working with kids in the fall who may be nervous or anxious or upset uh, about having to wear a mask or a face covering. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had kids in our family that have been wearing masks already. If we, you know, started to go to the store or something like that, um, and and to, surprisingly, they they adapt very well. You know, it almost is kind of a fun game. Uh, some of the little kids, I've seen them even put, uh, you know, characters and and some funny stuff on there, and and surprisingly, the kids really adapt very well to that. Uh, we've had kids in the hospital for other related conditions, kids who are get, being treated for leukemias, wear masks, they do fine. They, they, we've never really had an issue with that. It's really the really young ones, probably under the age of two, that really can't follow direction, that, that may struggle with that. But the ones that are older than that, that can follow instructions, actually surprisingly do well. It tends to be more the parent that's anxious than the child itself. Uh, just on a personal level, as someone who has you know, been in this fight against COVID since it arrived here, when you hear misinformation on things like masks, how does, how does that make you feel? Yeah, it's very fr it is very frustrating. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and, uh, you know, and it's, it's sometimes very difficult to even follow the logic as to where that's coming from. Um, most of the simple, it's simple measures trying to be very effective in reducing the spread. You know, here in Illinois, we've seen, you know, tremendous flattening of the curve, our, the positive rates, not even though we've expanded testing quite a bit, the number of positives have actually gone down and the number of cases being admitted have gone down. That is much more important. We're seeing fewer and fewer people get admitted to the hospital because of these measures that we took four, six, eight weeks ago there is an impact to that. There are other states, unfortunately, that are not seeing that. So it is, there's some simple measures that we can do that, that can be really effective. And the last question I had, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned about treating COVID? I know the last time we talked was a couple of months ago. So for, you know, from there, what, what have you learned that you want to share with people today? Um, I mean, so some of the stuff is, um, you know, is, is yes, you know, the older you are, the higher risk. But just being younger doesn't make you invincible. Um, we've had some people who are very healthy um, get very sick, may not have been hospitalized. Uh, we actually, a couple of them were hospitalized, may not have been intubated, but ha were very sick. And, um, you know, I hear this notion, you know, I'd rather just get sick. You really don't know what you're asking for. You know, I've got people who are very or young, very fit. Um, no medical problems, it's six weeks out and he's still not able to come back to work. The, the exhaustion, the fatigue, just even being able to climb a flight of stairs uh, is, is very debilitating. Um, I know he'll get better, but the amount of the impact on his life is, uh, is very significant. And we've seen that repeatedly. Um, we, know, we know that some of the treatments out there, um, we are getting a little bit better. Again, as early on information, we've been able to vet and make sure, see, see where we're at. Um, some of the earlier treatments certainly have fallen to the wayside. Um, we've seen remdesivir as a, as a drug for those patients who are really ill, uh, showing some benefit. And we think other drugs are going to come along and actually further help as well. Uh, we do know that uh, patients, uh, people who live in multi generational family homes, uh, they're at added risk as well. So um, that, that is, is, is there. There's also social uh, economic uh, um, factors that do lead to people developing, especially those who are daily wage earners who have to go to work and are unable to protect themselves. It's very hard for them to protect themselves and their families. And, and this is an, a very unfortunate impact. And therefore, some communities have been much harder hit by this than others. All right, well, Dr. Havis, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.